Today we are talking about dwarves. Stone hard, stubborn, fast in friendship and in enmity. The adopted middle children of Iluvatar, whom Tolkien described as able to suffer toil and hunger and hurt of body more hardily than all other speaking peoples. I've talked a lot on this channel about elves and men and otherworldly beings of the uttermost west, but for this video I want to focus solely on the Khazad, the Naugrim, the race of dwarves. Maya Govanen Melanin, and welcome to this video breaking down 10 top dwarves of Middle Earth's history. And just before I begin, let me say that the order of this list is more kind of just the order that I think makes sense to talk about them in, rather than a strict ranking of worst to best. That being said though, I am saving my absolute favourite dwarf for the number one spot right at the very end. Anyway, with that disclaimer done, here are 10 dwarves who fundamentally shape dwarven history. 10 dwarves to rule them all. Starting at number 10, Durin the Deathless, aka the first dwarf ever. Unlike the races of elves and men, the race of dwarves were not fashioned by Eru Iluvatar. They were given true life by Iluvatar, for only he wields the secret fire, the flame imperishable, the thing that gives an incarnate being its spirit, its fea, its soul. But the first seven fathers of the dwarves were fashioned and laid in the earth by the Vala Aule the lord of rock and metal and crafting and a kind of like the god of the fabric of the earth. And of the original seven dwarven fathers from whom all future dwarves are descended, the very first to awaken was Durin the First or Durin the Deathless. And Durin the Deathless earned his title by doing something that no other dwarf has ever come close to doing. He lived for thousands and thousands of years. We can't actually say how long exactly Durin the Deathless lived as we are never given a date of his awakening nor are we given a date of his eventual demise. But by examining the details that Tolkien did give us, we can estimate that Durin the Deathless must have lived for an absolute minimum of 2,395 years. Potentially though, he might have lived up to 4,312 years of life. To put that in perspective, we are told in the Lord of the Rings appendices that Dwalin, one of Thorin's company, lived an especially long life, and he was accounted particularly old by the time he died 94 years after the events of the Lord of the Rings. But Dwalin was only 340 when he passed, considerably older than the average dwarven life expectancy of about 250, but nowhere near the age of Durin the Deathless. And living a really long time is not the only thing that is awesome about Durin the Deathless. Unlike the other six fathers of dwarves who were laid down in pairs beneath a series of different mountains by Aule himself, the eldest, Durin, he came into the world alone. He first awoke within the holy mountain of Gundabad, but before long he journeyed south into the wilds of central Middle Earth, and there he became the first incarnate being ever to enter this part of the world. We are told that Durin the Deathless gave name to nameless hills and dells, and he was the first being, who isn't one of the Valar or the Maya, to look upon the three great peaks 
that will one day become known as the Mountains of Moria. In fact, it was Durin the Deathless who first founded and then began constructing the immense dwarven mansion of Khazad Doom. But Khazad Doom was not just a home for Durin and his people, it was a place of semi religious significance. When Durin the Deathless first arrived in this part of the world, he found a great lake, which in his Kuzdul language he named Keled Zaram, although in later days it would go on to be known as Lake Miramir. And when Durin peered into these glassy waters, he had a bit of a religious experience. He gazed down at the water, but what he saw was a lot more profound than just his reflection. In the mirror-like lake, Durin saw seven stars above his head, like a crown, the crown of Durin. He took this vision as a sign, and at the very spot where he knelt by the water's edge, a great stone pillar was later erected to commemorate this event. And although what I'm talking about right now happened a really long time ago, before the Silmarils, before the sun and the moon, before a great deal of the drama of the First Age, Durin Stone is still standing by the waters of Keled Zaram, even at the end of the Third Age. After the Fellowship of the Ring leave Moria, Gimli takes Frodo and Sam to see this ancient stone, and he explains why it is that the story of Durin the Deathless is so significant to Dwarven culture. Because although there are a few exceptions, pretty much every dwarf that you've ever heard of, and every dwarf on this list except for two, is a dwarf of Durin's folk. A dwarf who considered Durin the Deathless to be their first ever king. And there is, I guess, some interesting potential for speculation here, because as I mentioned, Durin was unique in that he was the only one of the seven fathers of the dwarves to awaken alone. He had no intended spouse, and so who was the mother of Durin's folk? How could Durin be the prime ancestor of all dwarves without a wife? Well, Tolkien never gives us a definite answer, but I guess my speculation would be that Durin must have met and then married some lady dwarf, potentially the daughter of a father from one of the other six clans, which would potentially suggest that the seven dwarven clans might not be quite as separate as we may be led to believe. And also don't forget, Durin the Deathless lived for thousands of years, so is it possible that he may have taken more than one wife? Is it conceivable that over the millennia he married a dwarf lady from all six of the other clans? Is that how all future dwarves are in some way descended from him? I don't know, as I say, it's all speculation, but I think the life of Durin the Deathless is a pretty fascinating rabbit hole to go down. Anyway, it was these dwarves of Durin's folk, also known as the Longbeards or Sigin Tarag in their language, who came to occupy the caves above Lake Miramir, and their descendants became the super iconic dwarves of Khazad Doom. The dwarves at the heart of pretty much every dwarven story throughout all of the Second and Third Ages. But Despite his epithet, Durin the Deathless did eventually die. Dwarves are mortal beings, thus they are all entitled to the gift of Iluvatar. Their spirits must depart Arda. However, within Dwarven mythology, Durin the Deathless is, once again, a bit of a unique case. 
It's hard to say whether this is like literally true or whether it's a legend within the legendarium. I would argue that it's not literally true, but according to the traditions of Durin's folk, Durin the Deathless did not entirely depart the world upon his death as other mortals do. Instead, it is believed that Durin the Deathless will return to rule Khazad Doom six more times before the days of the Dwarvish race are ended. In other words, Durin the Deathless will be reincarnated. And this is why it's such a big deal that over the course of Dwarven history, we have Durin the Second, Durin the Third, Durin the Fourth, Durin the Fifth, and Durin the Sixth, as well as a prophecy foretelling the future coming of Durin the Seventh, Durin the Last. These kings aren't so much named after Durin the Deathless, they are believed to be Durin the Deathless reborn. Which segues us nicely to number 9, Durin the Third. So, Durin the Third was the greatest known king of Khazad Doom during the Second Age. He was king at the time of the forging of the Rings of Power. And it is for Durin the Third that the super famous iconic doors of Durin were named. It was during his reign that they were built. And the reason that I enjoy Durin the Third so much is because he embodies something that we might often think of as being quite rare among dwarves, and that is an incredibly significant friendship with an elf. Celebrimbor the elven smith, the lord of Eregion, who unknowingly collaborated with Sauron to create 16 rings of power. And one of those 16 rings of power Celebrimbor gave to his great friend and neighbour, King Durin III. Well, Actually, whether that happened or not is a little bit controversial. According to the Lord of the Rings appendices, they say, that's the Dwarves of Durin's folk, not Tolkien himself, they say that it was given to the King of Khazad Doom, Durin III, by the Elven Smiths themselves and not by Sauron. However, this should, I think, be taken with a pinch of salt, especially considering that in the Silmarillion, we are told that after Celebrimbor was slain, Sauron gathered into his hands all the remaining rings of power. Seven rings he gave to the dwarves. So maybe Durin III got his ring of power from Sauron, Maybe he got it from his buddy Celebrimbor. But either way, when it comes to interracial alliances, I think it can be said that Durin III is one of the friendliest named dwarves in all of Tolkien's writings. Not only does he forge a hugely important friendship between the dwarves of Khazad Doom and the elves of Eregion, but in a roundabout kind of way, this friendship is also crucial in the story of the founding of Rivendell. Durin III sent his dwarven warriors to Eregion to defend the elven realm during the War of the Elves and Sauron. Unfortunately, Eregion fell to the power of Sauron anyway, the dwarves of Khazad Doom were driven back, and Celebrimbor was turned into a pincushion. But the actions of Durin III were not in vain. As his warriors retreated back towards Khazad Doom, they drew a large part of Sauron's army with them, and because they did, a number of the Elven warriors defending Eregion were able to escape with their lives and live to fight another day. Among these Elven survivors of Eregion was Elrond. While Sauron's armies clashed with Durin III's, Elrond escaped into the north, and there he is destined to establish the last homely house between the mountains and the sea, known to the elves as Imladris, 
and to men as Rivendell. If not for Durin III and his friendship with Celebrimbor, perhaps there would be no Imladris. And just before I move on, I can't really talk about Durin III without also mentioning another dwarf who was kicking around at this time, and his name is Narvi. Now, Narvi is a character we know very little about, but he is famous for one thing in particular. And just like Durin III, Narvi's contribution to the story is intimately bound to his friendship with the elven lord Celebrimbor. Because it is with the aid of Celebrimbor that Narvi built the mighty Doors of Durin, the super famous west gate of Khazad Doom that the Fellowship of the Ring will one day enter through. And of course, it is for Narvi's king, Durin III, that the Doors of Durin are so named. Upon the door, Narvi carved the crown of seven stars that Durin the Deathless beheld in the water of Keled Zaram. Celebrimbor carved the eight-rayed star symbolising the house of his grandfather, Feanor, and in the top two corners of the door are the Tengwar letters Kalama and Ore, which in the mode of Beleriand stand for Celebrimbor and Narvi. And at the bottom of the door is the Tengwar letter Ando, which in this case represents the D for Durin. So these doors really are an excellent symbol for the legacy of their namesake, Durin III, and the amazingly far-reaching friendship that he forged with Celebrimbor. In fact, the names of all three of these characters, Durin, Narvi, and Celebrimbor, are all written upon the doors in Elvish, and read aloud by Gandalf, about five and a half thousand years after they were made. In The Lord of the Rings, Gandalf reads for the Fellowship, Enin Durin Aran Moria, Pedo Melon Amino, Imnarvi Hayenekant Celebrimbor Oeregion, Tethanti Thiwahin. So, even five and a half millennia after their deaths, the legacies of Durin the Third, as well as Narvi and Celebrimbor, are still going strong in Middle Earth. Number eight, King Azagal. Now, King Azagal is a little bit atypical on this list in that he is one of only two dwarves I've included who isn't one of Durin's folk. Azagal is a king of the Blue Mountains, a king of the First Age. He is the Lord of Belagost. He is a ruler of either the Firebeards or the Broadbeams, it's not clear which, but a very different clan from the dwarves who founded Khazad Doom. You see, Azagal is the leader of a great kingdom of First Age Silmarillion dwarves, and although there's not a huge amount to say about him, the details that we are given paint an incredibly badass picture. Firstly, Azagal is one of only a very small number of dwarves who uses a Kuzdul name. Kuzdul is the language of the dwarves, it was taught to them by their maker, Aule, but for that very reason, their language has an almost religious significance to the dwarves, and they very seldom speak it to outsiders. All the dwarves have a Kuzdul name, but with the exception of Azagal and maybe a handful of others in the Silmarillion, they do not ever reveal their Kuzdul names to outsiders. You know, Thorin, Gimli, even Durin, these are not Kuzdul names, they are names given in the language of the Northmen, but Azagal, that is as dwarvish as they come. And if we were to picture, you know, the most quintessentially epic dwarven warrior king, that's basically what Azagal is. 
Azegal led his dwarves of Belagost to fight in the Nirnayath Arnoidiad, the biggest and also most disastrous battle of the entire First Age. And yes, I'm aware of the War of Wrath, but that's less of a battle and more of an apocalypse. But just like Durin the Third, King Azagal did actually have a very close friendship with the elves, at least some of them. And it was actually Celebrimbor's uncle, an amazingly awesome character called Myathros, who recruited Azagal and his dwarves to fight in this battle. However, for reasons that I explore in much more detail in my trilogy of videos explaining this Nirnayath Arnoidiad battle, things do not go well for our good guys. Lots of very important characters are killed in this battle, and lots of them go out with this kind of epic, fiery blaze of glory. But even among them, Azagal is still somewhat of a special case. So, during this Nirnayath Arnoidiad, Azagal and his dwarven army face off against Glaurung, the father of all dragons. We are told that the strength and terror of the Great Worm were now great indeed, and elves and men withered before him. But Azagal and his dwarves, they did not. They were the last of all the eastern forces to stand firm against the enemy, for dwarves were created by Aule with a particular capacity to withstand heat and flame. And in battle, these First Age dwarves famously arrayed themselves in great war masks that were hideous to look upon, but gave them the ability to withstand dragon fire. And so, Azagal and his warriors formed a ring around the great dragon Glaurung, as well as his brood of lesser dragons, and although Glaurung's scales were hard like steel, they were not foolproof against the axes of the dwarves. Eventually, the great dragon lashed out in his rage and his pain, and he struck down the dwarf king Azagal with a mortal wound. As Azagal lay dying, Glaurung slithered over him, and with the last of his strength, Azagal drew a dagger and he drove it into the dragon's belly. The agony of the injury caused Glaurung to flee the battlefield, and the other evil beasts of Morgoth followed him back to their evil fortress. Azagal gave his life for this cause, but thanks to his dagger, Glaurung was not seen again by any of the free people for 23 years. However, although this great battle was far from over just because Glaurung was no longer a part of it, with the death of Azagal, it was over for the dwarves. They raised up the body of their king and they slowly bore it from the battlefield with honour, while singing a dirge in deep voices as if it were a funeral ceremony. And what makes this particularly cool is that the orcs, and you know, the other servants of Morgoth, let the dwarves do this. They could have attacked Azagal's warriors while they were carrying his body to safety, but they didn't. Which I think is a testament to the reverence afforded to King Azagal. Even the most despicably dishonourable creatures in the world do not dare defile the funeral of Azagal, nor come between the surviving dwarves and their sense of duty to a fallen king. Number 7, Telkar. So, here is another lesser known dwarf of the First Age, and apart from Azagal, he is the only other dwarf on this list who isn't one of Durin's folk. 
Telkar was a dwarf of the Blue Mountains, just like Azagal, a dwarf of Beleriand. But his main claim to fame is that he is one of, if not the absolute most, skilled craftsmen ever to exist among the race of dwarves. I know that's saying a lot, but along with maybe Sauron and Feanor and Celebrimbor, Telkar is probably one of the most talented craftsmen ever to live in Middle-earth. Among the objects that Telkar is famous for crafting, there is the Dragon Helm of Doralomin, which I will talk about in great detail very soon in my Children of Hurin Explained series. But Telkar also forged a knife, a dagger, called Angrist. And Angrist was used by Beren to cut a Silmaril from Morgoth's crown. One of the most important moments in the entire First Age. And also, Telkara forged the great sword Narsil, which will, of course, be wielded by Elendil during the War of the Last Alliance at the end of the Second Age, and its broken hilt will be used by Isildur to cut the ruling ring from Sauron's finger. Then, over 3,000 years later, Telkar's broken sword will be reforged by the elves of Rivendell and presented to Isildur's heir, Aragorn. Returning this sword to the City of Kings is a massive part of what Aragorn's character is all about in The Lord of the Rings, and yet it's very easy to forget that this incredibly important sword, wielded by the kings of the Dúnedain and reforged by elves of Rivendell, was in fact originally crafted back in the deeps of time by a dwarven smith called Telkar. And just before I move on, I think there's one more interesting thing to say about Telkar, and that's his name. I know I just said that the vast majority of dwarven names come from the language of the Northmen, and thus Azagal is an interesting exception, because that's Kuzdul, but Telkar may be an even more unusual exception. We don't know for certain what language the name Telkar comes from, Tolkien never specified exactly, but it's not the language of the Northmen, and if it is a Kuzdul word, it's a weird one. That ch k digraph, that is not found in any other Kuzdul word, but it is really rather common in Sindarin, a language of the Elves. So could Telekar be a Sindarin name? Well, his greatest achievements are all more significant to Elvish and Dúnedain culture than they are to Dwarves, and Arngrist and Narsil are both Elvish words, so maybe Telkar does have the unique distinction of being remembered to history as the only Dwarf with an Elvish name. Perhaps well over a thousand years before Narvi and Durin III were befriending Celebrimbor, and over six thousand years before Gimli was befriending Legolas, Telkar of the First Age may have been the original dwarven elf friend. We can't say for certain, I don't want to imply that that's a fact, but it's an interesting thing to ponder. Number six. King Thror, grandfather of Thorin Oakenshield. So, if you've seen Peter Jackson's The Hobbit movies, you'll know who this character is, and if you've read The Lord of the Rings Appendices, you'll know that the character in Peter Jackson's movies is only a fraction of the character that Tolkien wrote. King Thror was born about 500 years before the events of The Lord of the Rings, but from the very beginning of his life, we see that it is seeped in tragedy. Thror was the eldest son of the king of Durin's folk in the late Third Age, and his father ruled as the king of the Grey Mountains. But when Thror was only 47 years old, not old by dwarven standards, 
his father and his youngest brother were slain by a cold drake of the northern wastes. In fact, the death of Thrall's father marked the end of a 19 year long war of the dwarves and dragons, which sadly culminated in a pretty decisive victory for the dragons. The Grey Mountains became a breeding ground for orcs and they were eventually abandoned by the dwarves who had spent centuries living there. Some of these dwarves migrated to the Iron Hills, but the majority followed their new king, Thror, back to the lonely mountain of Erebor, and there Thror became the first king under the mountain in 380 years. He returned the Arken Stone to the mountain where it was found. He re-established a friendship between the dwarves of Erebor and the Northmen of Dale. And for 180 years, the realms of Erebor and Dale flourished and prospered side by side. All was good for the dwarves of Durin's folk. Until... The coming of Smaug. He flew down from the withered heath, and after raising Dale to a fiery ruin, he descended upon the lonely mountain and the kingdom of Thror. Many, many, many dwarves were killed by Smaug, but a few escaped, and the last two dwarves to leave the lonely mountain were King Thror and his son, his heir, who stole away through a secret backdoor known only to the king. This secret backdoor, by the way, is the same one that Bilbo will enter through in the events of The Hobbit, the one that requires the key to be slid into the keyhole that can only be seen during the last light of Durin's day. Also, in case you're wondering, Thorin was alive at the time this was happening, but he wasn't actually in Erebor at the time of Smaug's attack, and so he only saw the desolation of the dragon from afar. Anyway, eventually Thror led his son and his grandson and a number of Erebor survivors on a very long journey from their home all the way into the lands of Dunland, where they lived and toiled as homeless refugees for 20 years. But for King Thror, the shame and the loss was too great to bear. While his son and his grandson remained in Dunland with their people, Thror set off on one last journey of his own. You see, as the king of Durin's folk, Thror is a direct descendant of Durin, which means the Ring of Durin, which was allegedly given to Durin III by Celebrimbor four and a half thousand years ago, now sits upon the finger of Thror. In fact, by this point in the story, that dwarven ring of power is known as the Ring of Thror. But before Thror went off on his final journey, he gave his ring of power to his son, along with the map showing the back door of Erebor and the key required to open it. Then Thror journeyed away from Dunland into the north with only a single companion, and the destination that Thror headed for was Moria. If Thror could reclaim the kingdom of Durin the Deathless before the end of his life, surely it would kind of make right the losses of the Grey Mountains and the Lonely Mountain, and also Mount Gundabad and all the other places that Durin's folk have had stolen from them. If the heir of Durin could look upon the glory of Khazad Doom, maybe everything would be okay. Alongside his sole companion, a dwarf called Nar, Thror crossed the Misty Mountains and he came to the East Gate of Moria. And there, 
in the valley of Azanulbizar, near the waters of Keled Zaram and the stone of Durin, Thror found the gate of Moria open and unguarded. Now, this Nar fellow, he begged Thror to beware. Do not venture into the dark of Moria. But King Thror ignored him. He passed through the great gates of Durin the Deathless as his rightful heir, returning to his ancestral home. And after that, King Thror was never seen alive by any dwarf ever again. You see, there was another self-proclaimed king in Moria at this time, and his name was Azog, the great orc chieftain who murdered Thror, who cut off his head and branded his own name into the king's forehead. Then Azog hurled Thror's severed head out of the gate, along with a few coins of little worth to insinuate that the king was a beggar, and the rest of Thror's body that was hacked apart by Azog's orcs. His flesh was fed to the crows, and that would be the very end of Thror's story, except that this desecration of Durin's heir was witnessed by that other dwarf called Nar. And when Nar returned to the dwarves of Dunland, he brought with him the tragic news of what had befallen their late King Thror. And in so relaying this information, Nar lit the spark that began the war not only to avenge Thror, but to eradicate all legacy of Azog. Which brings us to number five. This guy, the son of Thror. He has a fascinating story, but before I get into that, um, how do you pronounce his name? In the movies, they pronounce it Thrain, and I have occasionally heard it pronounced Thrine, but I don't actually think either of those are correct. Unlike with Elvish words, for example, Tolkien did not give us a definite pronunciation guide for dwarf names, so I don't want to state that, you know, I'm definitely right, we could talk about pronouncing these names for hours and never arrive at any kind of a consensus, but that being said, at this moment in time, I think, for the sake of consistency more than anything else, this name should be pronounced Thrain. One of the great debates among Tolkien fans is whether Gimli's father and his uncle are called Oin and Gloin or Owen and Glowin, but we know that The Hobbit was first read by Tolkien to his children, and we know from a speech delivered by Michael Tolkien and also a foreword written by Christopher Tolkien that as children they wrote their own stories imitating the ones that their father read to them, and in Michael Tolkien's story there is a giant frog called Ollum, a wizard called Scandalf, and some dwarves called Throwin, Blowin, and Goin. In my mind, this is the most compelling piece of evidence to suggest that Tolkien himself pronounced these names with two syllables, and if it's Glowin instead of Gloin, then I think it should be Thra'in instead of Thrain. There are a few other characters with this type of name, Da'in and Ba'in, for example, often pronounced Dane and Bane, but given the available evidence, I think the consistent way to pronounce these names is like Dwalin or Balin, just without the L. Darin and Barin. Anyway, now that we've established what this guy's called, let's talk about what makes Thrain, son of Thror, such an interesting character. When Na told him about the brutal beheading and mutilation of his father's corpse, Thrain sat for seven whole days, neither moving nor speaking 
But on the seventh day, he suddenly stood and he declared, This cannot be born. After three years of preparation, Thra'in gathered to him one of the greatest dwarven armies ever assembled in Middle-earth's history. The exiles of Erebor were reinforced by their kin from the Iron Hills, as well as dwarves who were not even of Durin's folk, dwarves of the Blue Mountains, and even dwarves of the Red Mountains in the far, far east. Because the desecration of Khazad Doom by Azog and his filth was an insult to all dwarves, and there were some from among all dwarves who joined Thra'in's war to destroy him. But it wasn't just Khazad Doom that Thra'in wanted to reclaim from the enemy, the war of the dwarves and orcs was about cleansing the entire range of the Misty Mountains, assaulting every orc stronghold that had been growing there for centuries, if not millennia. And among the very first places that Thra'in reconquered on behalf of his ancestors was the holy mountain of Gundabad, the place where Durin the Deathless had first awoken and entered the world. Now, we aren't given many details about the early battles in this war, but we know they were successful. The army of Thra'in worked its way south, clearing orc hold after orc hold until they eventually came down to the valley of Azanulbizar, just outside the great gates of Moria. And it was at Azanulbizar that the decisive battle was fought. Dwarves of all seven houses versus the Orc legions of Azog. Now, I will go into more detail on this battle just a little later down the list, but the Cliff Notes version of it is that the dwarves won, but at a very heavy cost. Thra'in's second son, was slain, that's Thorin's brother, and so was his cousin, Na'in, Lord of the Iron Hills. Thra'in himself was blinded in one eye, wounded in one leg, and the dwarven dead were beyond the count of grief. However, despite what the Hobbit movies may have you believe, Azog himself was killed in this battle. His head was hewed from his body, just as he hewed the head from Thraws. It was impaled on a stake, and those coins of little worth that he parted with after killing Thror, they were stuffed inside his dead mouth. Azog was gone. Thror was avenged. But Moria could not yet be retaken. A nameless fear still dwelt inside, and it was not yet time for Durin's folk to return to their ancestral halls of Khazad Doom. After the end of the war, Thra'in and his son Thorin led their people to new halls in the Blue Mountains, and for 40 years that is where they made their home. But it is not yet quite the end of Thra'in's story. Perhaps due to the influence of his Ring of Power, Thra'in slowly began to grow more and more consumed with thoughts and memories of the wealth of Erebor, the wealth that was stolen from his father by Smaug. So, exactly 100 years before the events of The Hobbit, Thra'in departed the Blue Mountains with a small number of companions, including the brothers Balin and Dwalin, who would of course go on to accompany Thorin on 
his quest. And they headed east, once again over the Misty Mountains towards the Lonely Mountain. However, while travelling through the Great Forest of Mirkwood, Thrain's company were harassed by orcs and wolves. And during that journey, Thrain disappeared. Just like when his father Thor set off inside Moria, Thrain was never seen again by any dwarf ever. But unlike his father Thor, Thrain did not die immediately. Instead, he suffered a far worse fate. You see, King Thrain was captured in southern Mirkwood, and he was taken to the dungeons of Dol Guladur. And there, Sauron finally reclaimed the seventh dwarven ring of power, the Ring of Durin. Thrain was held and tortured for five years in the Necromancer's stronghold until one day, Dol Guladur was visited in secret by Gandalf the Grey, doing a little bit of reconnaissance on behalf of the White Council. In the deepest dungeon of the Hill of Sorcery, Gandalf found a dwarf. The dwarf was so broken and so diminished by the torment of the necromancer that he could not remember even his own name. But he did give to Gandalf the only two possessions he had left, a mysterious key and a map of the Lonely Mountain. Then, after giving these things to Gandalf, the dwarf fell dead. And it was many, many years before Gandalf figured out who it was that he'd encountered in the dungeons of Dol Guladur, the vanished king of Durin's folk, Thrain, father of number four, King Thorin Oakenshield. So, this Thor Thrain Thorin trinity is one of the most important parts of Dwarven history in the Third Age. The story that began with Thorin's grandfather doesn't really come to an end until the death of Thorin himself. Unlike many other names on this list, Thorin is of course a dwarf that even the most casual Tolkien fan has almost certainly heard of. But without wanting to overbash Peter Jackson's Hobbit movies, to understand the Thorin that Tolkien wrote, you really do need to forget pretty much everything about movie Thorin. Richard Armitage is a great actor, and he would have been perfectly cast to play a kind of grim but noble kingdomless king in The Hobbit, a sort of proto-Aragorn, but with a bit of an edgier personality. However, that role, the one that this actor is perfect for, is Bard the Bowman, not Thorin Oakenshield. And the reason I think this great actor was totally miscast has nothing to do with his acting ability, and everything to do with the fact that Thorin is the oldest of all the dwarves in The Hobbit, and that is so important to his character. He was born in the Lonely Mountain pre-Smaug, but he was only 24 years old when the dragon took it from his grandfather, but he was 195 years old when he met Bilbo Baggins and began his quest to reclaim what Smaug took. In Tolkien's writings, Thorin was barely much more than a child when Smaug descended upon the Lonely Mountain, and yet it wasn't until the very last year of his relatively long life 
that he ever looked upon his ancestral home again. His entire life, almost, was spent in exile. Every day, for nearly two centuries, Thorin had to deal with the fact that he was not the king he should be by right. He is the heir of Durin himself, and yet he's also a beggar. He has the pride and the bearing of one of the greatest kings of the Third Age, but he has no kingdom. And that tragedy is crucial in understanding Thorin. His quest is all about leading the next generation of dwarves to reclaim the very thing that his whole life has been defined by not having. To ensure that his heirs, Philly and Killy, would not be denied that same birthright that he has been denied. Anyway, King Thorin Oakenshield, as you surely know, he acquired that epithet Oakenshield during the Battle of Azanulabizar, when he used an oaken branch to replace his broken shield. He fought alongside his father to avenge his grandfather, but when the battle was over, Thorin returned to his life of exile. Before too long, he led his people away from Dunland and up into the Blue Mountains, where he did at least have, you know, halls of his own and he was surrounded by other dwarves. But when Thraen journeyed off into Mirkwood and was then never seen again, Thorin became the new king of Durin's folk. And although there was peace and some limited prosperity in the Blue Mountains, as the years wore on, Thorin spent more and more time fixating his thoughts on the Lonely Mountain, just as his father did, and his desire to take back what was lost grew greater and greater, until one fateful day, by chance, if chance it were, Thorin Oakenshield happened upon Gandalf the Grey. In some versions, their chance meeting takes place in Bree, in other versions they meet on the road outside of Bree, but in all of versions, Gandalf has a long discussion with Thorin in which he finally figures out that the mysterious dwarf in the dungeons of Dol Guladur was in fact Thorin's long-lost father. And the map and the key that Gandalf had been given by that pitiable dwarf who had forgotten his own name was meant for Thorin. And, as you know, this chance meeting is the catalyst that gets the events of The Hobbit underway. Upon Gandalf's insistence, Bilbo is taken along with Thorin and the rest of the company, and about six months after the unexpected party, Bilbo and the Thirteen Dwarves all arrive on the doorstep of the Lonely Mountain. Obviously, there's a lot more to say about this, but that's kind of the plot of The Hobbit, so I will skip over the death of Smaug and focus instead on Thorin's final battle. The Battle of Five Armies. The battle that effectively represents a kind of sequel to the Battle of Azanulabizar. Back then it was Thraen versus Azog, and now it is the son of Thraen versus the son of Azog, an orc called Bolg. And this is another example where we are going to have to disregard pretty much everything from the third Hobbit movie. It does absolutely zero justice to this battle, or these characters, or this part of Middle-earth's history, really. In the book, as tensions build between the elves and the men and the dwarves, an alliance of orcs and wild wolves under the command of that Bolg son of Azog suddenly appear. And as they do, all quarrels between elves, men, and dwarves are forgotten. The Battle of Five Armies begins. And just as it's reaching its crescendo, 
Thorin and company break their own barricade and they burst out onto the battlefield. Tolkien wrote, Out leapt the king under the mountain, and his companions followed him. Hood and cloak were gone. They were in shining armor, and red light leapt from their eyes. In the gloom, the great dwarf gleamed like gold in a dying fire. Thorin rallies dwarves and men and elves to his side, and when he takes command of the battle, the warriors of Da'in Ironfoot, Bard the Bowman and the elven king of Mirkwood all look to him for leadership. However, as with pretty much every story featuring the dwarves of Durin's folk, this one does also end in tragedy. As you know, Thorin is killed in this battle, and his heirs, his sister sons, Feely and Kili, are slain too. The line of Azog is ended with the death of Bolg, but the line of Thror is also ended with the deaths of Thorin and Fili and Kili. So, the kingship of Durin's folk has to pass to Thorin's second cousin, the grandson of Thror's brother. But I'll come back to him in just a little bit. Number three, Balin, son of Fundin. So, relative to, like, Thorin, or Durin, or Azagal, Balin might not seem quite so important to the overarching history of dwarven folk, but I would argue that Balin is one of the most likeable dwarves that Tolkien ever wrote. Balin is just such a lovely guy. Apart from Thorin, the eldest, Balin is the only other dwarf in The Hobbit to remember Erebor before the coming of Smaug. He is the second oldest dwarf in the company, although he was only seven years old when the dwarves of the Lonely Mountain were ousted from their home by the dragon. He and his father Fundin were among those dwarves who followed Thror all the way into Dunland, and by the time of the Battle of Azanulabizar, Balin was 36. So, although we can't say for certain, it is very conceivable that young Balin was present in the battle to take down Azog and avenge his former king Thror. We know that his father Fundin died in that battle. As I already mentioned, Balin and his younger brother Dwalin accompanied King Thrain on his disastrous journey east after the battle, and following an attack by orcs and wolves and evil birds of Mirkwood, they never saw Thrain again. However, the first really big thing that Balin definitely did to affect the history of Middle-earth was to be the kind of unofficial second-in-command of Thorin's company during his quest to reclaim the Lonely Mountain. And I think a big part of why I like Balin so much is because on that quest, he had a uniquely lovely friendship with Bilbo. Right at the very beginning of the quest, it was Balin who was looking out for Bilbo at the Green Dragon Inn. It was Balin who showed particular affection to Bilbo after the bad business with the spiders, and when the time comes for Bilbo to enter the Lonely Mountain and to face the dragon, Balin alone, of all the dwarves, volunteers to venture inside the mountain with him, and it is Balin who carries Bilbo back out again. In fact, right at the very, very end of The Hobbit, in the final scene of the whole book, Bilbo is back in Bag End, writing his memoirs some years after the events of the story, when he receives a pair of visitors. One of these visitors is Gandalf, and the other is Bilbo's buddy Balin. 
who made the journey all the way from the lonely mountain back to the Shire just to see his dear friend. However, although that is the end of The Hobbit, it is not the end of Balin's story. And as is becoming a real running theme with the entries on this list, the full story of Balin's life is another really tragic one. As I'm sure we all know, 48 years after the events of The Hobbit, but 29 years before like the main events of The Lord of the Rings, Balin led a quest of his own to return to Moria and to hopefully lay the foundations for reclaiming the greatest of all the ancestral strongholds of Durin's folk. Balin led a relatively small group of dwarven adventurers, including Ori and Owen, and after a short battle with some orcs at the Great Gates, Balin and his followers entered Moria. They became the first dwarves to inhabit that stronghold of their ancestors in over a thousand years. For five years, things went really, really well for Balin's colony. He set up a throne for himself in the chamber of Mazabul, the orcs that still lingered in Moria were ousted, and many dwarven treasures and heirlooms from ages past were reclaimed on behalf of Durin's folk. However, as is always the case with dwarven history, the good times cannot last. Only seven years before Bilbo Baggins's 111st birthday party, Balin journeyed out of Moria's Great Gates, and he wandered down to the waters of Keled Zaram, the very place where Durin the Deathless had the vision that inspired him to found Khazad Doom in the first place. But as Balin gazed into the mirror-like water, just as Durin the Deathless did way back in the deeps of time, he was suddenly shot by an orc archer. The wound proved fatal, and Balin, Lord of Moria, was slain. He was entombed within the chamber of Mazabul, the place that was once his throne room was now his grave, and unfortunately for his people, after the death of Balin, things swiftly turned from bad to worse. A whole host of orcs, probably coming from Dol Guladur, attacked Balin's colony, and although the dwarves fiercely defended their new home, in the end, they were simply outnumbered and outmatched. Owen, Gimli's uncle, he was killed by the Watcher in the water, the rest of the dwarves were killed by orcs, and Ori, the scribe, he survived just long enough to record the final fate of Balin's colony in the Book of Mazabul before he too was killed by orcs. Now, the truth of what happened to this colony was completely unknown to the dwarves of Erebor, and a very large part of the reason why Balin's former companion Glowin and his son Gimli came to Rivendell in time to partake in the Council of Elrond is because they came hoping to find knowledge of what happened to Balin. Anyway. Speaking of Glowin and his son, number two, Gimli of the Fellowship of the Ring. Gimli is a character who I absolutely love. I'm aware that I do say that rather frequently about a great range of characters, but it is always true. Anyway, you're probably already pretty familiar with Gimli's actions and interactions in The Lord of the Rings, and there's not enough time in this video for me to go into all of that. So right now, I'll focus instead on who Gimli was before The Lord of the Rings, and what he got up to after it. Because there is a very interesting fun fact about Gimli that I feel is often overlooked, despite the fact that it really is quite important in understanding who he is and where he came from. 
You see, Gimli's great-great-grandfather was the brother of the father of King Thor, which means Gimli is part of the royal family. He is an admittedly minor prince of the line of Durin. And although Gimli's royal heritage isn't really relevant during The Lord of the Rings, it is a significant part of his character going into the Fourth Age and beyond The Lord of the Rings. After the ring is destroyed and Aragorn is crowned High King of both Gondor and Arnor, Gimli and Legolas venture off together on a bit of a Middle-earth road trip. They journey to Fangorn Forest together and then to the glittering caves of Aglarond, behind the Hornburg at Helm's Deep. And these glittering caves have a massive impact on Gimli. He first beheld the great mansions of stone during the Battle of the Hornburg, and when he later describes them to Legolas, he says this, My good Legolas, do you know that the caverns of Helm's Deep are vast and beautiful? There would be an endless pilgrimage of dwarves merely to gaze at them if such things were known to be. Aye, indeed, they would pay pure gold for a brief glance. Immeasurable halls, filled with an everlasting music of water, as fair as Keled Zaram in the starlight. Gems and crystals and veins of precious ore glint in the polished walls, and the light glows through folded marbles, translucent as the living hands of Queen Galadriel. There are columns of white and saffron and dawn rose Legolas, fluted and twisted like dreamlike forms, cities such as the mind of Durin could scarce have imagined. Legolas responds to his friend by saying, Do not tell all your kindred. One family of busy dwarfs with hammer and chisel might mar more than they made. But Gimli replies, None of Durin's race would mine those caves for stone or ore, not if diamonds and gold could be got there. We would tend these glades of flowering stone, not quarry them. And lights, Legolas, we should make lights, such lamps as once shone in Khazad Doom. And, to be fair to him, after the Lord of the Rings, Gimli totally does put his money where his mouth is. When his road trip with Legolas eventually comes to an end, Gimli returns to his home and to his father up in the Lonely Mountain, but he does not stay there. Instead, he recruits a bunch of Durin's folk from Erebor, and then he leads them all the way south to the glittering caves within the Kingdom of Rohan. And there he establishes a brand new dwarven colony. Gimli becomes known as the Lord of the Glittering Caves, and for the first 120 years of the Fourth Age, he was the great dwarven prince of a great dwarven principality nestled within the great realm of Eomer, King of the Mark. Obviously, Gimli's friendship with Legolas is hugely significant to both characters, and I don't in any way want to undersell that, but I think that Gimli's friendship with Eomer is also hugely significant. And the fact that Eomer yields these glittering caves to Gimli's dwarves, and then Gimli's dwarves use their skills and knowledge to enrich and enhance the kingdom of Rohan, is a wonderful way of tying up these two characters who did not begin as friends. And it's not just Rohan that Gimli's dwarven community lends a hand in improving. Shortly after the destruction of the One Ring, Gimli and some dwarves of the Lonely Mountain come to the City of Kings, and there they help to rebuild the great gates of Minas Tirith, which were destroyed by Grond. 
And these new dwarf forged gates are reinforced with mithril, so that Gondor's capital will never again suffer the indignity of being broken by the enemy. More so than most other dwarves in Middle-earth's history, Gimli really is defined by his friendship with other people, both elves and men. And because of these relatively unique friendships, at least by Third Age standards, Gimli gets an absolutely unique ending among all dwarves. Because by the ripe old age of 262, Gimli is the very last surviving member of the Fellowship of the Ring, except of course for the deathless Legolas. And whilst Gimli was creating his own dwarven colony within the realm of Eomer, Legolas was creating his own elvish colony within the realm of Eomer's sister, Eowun, and of course her husband, Faramir. Legolas became the elven prince of Ithilien. In fact, Legolas and his elves worked alongside Gimli and his dwarves in the re-strengthening of Minas Tirith. But by the year 120 of the Fourth Age, Aragorn was dead, and Gimli was getting old. So, the last two members of the Fellowship of the Ring set off on one last journey together. Legolas built a boat for them both, and he set it upon the river Anduin. Then, Legolas and Gimli sailed together into the uttermost west. They left Middle-earth forever. And in Tolkien's words, the friendship of Legolas and Gimli was greater than any that had been between elf and dwarf. I'm not sure if this was intended by Tolkien, I might just be projecting a little bit, but I find that there is a fascinating little likeness between Gimli son of Glowin in the Fourth Age and Durin the Deathless back in the deeps of time. Durin is, of course, the reason that the dwarf halls of Khazad Doom exist, and Gimli is the reason why the dwarf halls in Aglarond exist. On the one hand, Gimli's glittering caves can't really be compared to Khazad Doom, but on the other hand, there are parallels. When Gimli first describes these caves to Legolas, he says that the water is as fair as Keled Zaram in the starlight. And Gimli goes on to talk about the cities of stone such as the mind of Durin could scarce have imagined in the glittering caves, as well as such lamps as once shone in Khazad Doom. I don't want to make too big of a deal out of this, but if we look at all of the recorded dwarven history from a, you know, a bird's eye view, we'll see that it is kind of bookended by the mansions of Durin the Deathless in the very, very beginning, and the caves of Gimli son of Glowin towards the very end. He may be most well known for being that dwarf that's included in the Fellowship of the Ring, but I would argue that there is a huge amount more to Gimli's character than what's touched upon in The Lord of the Rings. Anyway, finally, this brings us to my favorite dwarf. Number one, King Da'in Ironfoot. Da'in is my favorite dwarf, not only because of how epic and awesome he is, but also because he kind of pulls together so much of the dwarven history that I've already talked about in this video. Remember when I first mentioned King Thror, and how he led a lot of his people back to the Lonely Mountain after the War of the Dwarves and Dragons? Well, Thror had two younger brothers, one of whom was killed by a dragon, but the other one 
survived, and his name was Gror. Just as Thorin Oakenshield is the grandson of Thor, Darien Ironfoot is the grandson of Gror. And whereas Thor led many dwarven refugees back to the Lonely Mountain, Gror led a different group of those same refugees and he established a new realm in the Iron Hills. And as you will soon see, the dwarves of the Iron Hills and the dwarves of the Lonely Mountain have a fast and formidable friendship, which lasts for centuries. While Thorin was spending his childhood in the Lonely Mountain, Darin was growing up in the Iron Hills. Until, in the year 2799 of the Third Age, Darin went to go and fight in the first of three great battles, all of which will not only define his life, but his life will kind of define the outcome of these battles. Three battles that dictate the trajectory of Darin's story and the fate of all of Durin's folk. So, the first of these battles that I'm talking about is, of course, the Battle of Azanulbizar, fought outside the Great Gates of Moria between the Dwarven Alliance of King Thrain and the Orc armies of Azog. And what I find so interesting about Darin in this Battle of Azanulbizar is that he was so, so young when it was fought. In the year 2799, Darin was only 32. I know that doesn't sound crazy young, but Tolkien himself refers to Darin in this battle as only a stripling in the Reckoning of the Dwarves. As a point of reference, Feely and Keely, the youngest dwarves to appear in The Hobbit, were respectively 82 and 77 at the time of their quest. And we know that Gimli was considered too young to join the company of Thorin, despite the fact that at the time he was almost double the age that Darin Ironfoot was during the Battle of Azanulbizar. And yet, young Darin isn't just kind of present in this battle, he potentially has a more significant role at Azanulbizar than any other character. While Thorin was earning the epithet Oakenshield, and King Thrain was being blinded in one eye and hobbled in one leg, Darin Ironfoot fought alongside his father, and he watched his father die at the hand of Azog. So, Darin Ironfoot did what all other dwarves wanted to do. He killed Azog. With his iconic red axe, and upon the very doorstep of Moria, Darin beheaded Azog, just as Azog beheaded Thror. And this deed was heralded a magnificent feat among Durin's folk, and it was made all the more impressive by Darin's staggering youth. Azog's head was impaled on a spike, and when the battle was won, Thrain sought to enter Moria and to reclaim it on behalf of his people, but he was dissuaded from doing so by Darin himself. As Darin fought Azog before the gates of Moria, he looked inside, and he perceived that a great terror, Durin's bane, still dwelt there. One day, the time would come for Durin's folk to return to Moria, but Darin had the wisdom to perceive that it was not this day. These dwarves had united to avenge Thror, to take down Azog, and to rid the Misty Mountains of his minions. And thanks to Darin Ironfoot, that had been achieved. I mean, not permanently, we know that Bolg is still out there, and we know that the Misty Mountains are going to be infested once again by orcs pretty soon, but in that moment, it was time for this union of dwarves to disband. 
and for Da'in to return home, where he would soon go on to become the new Lord of the Iron Hills. And for the next 141 years, there's not a huge amount to say about Da'in Ironfoot, except that 67 years after the Battle of Azanulabizar, Da'in had a son whom he named after his beloved cousin, Thorin. The son of Da'in Ironfoot is remembered to history as Thorin Stonehelm, and eventually he will succeed his namesake and his father and become King Thorin III. However, as you are most certainly already aware, there is another famous battle in which Da'in Ironfoot and his warriors from the Iron Hills will come to the aid of the more famous Thorin. Oakenshield in the Lonely Mountain, and that battle is of course the Battle of Five Armies. Just under 150 years since the Battle of Azanulbizar and the deaths of Azog and Darin's father, the son of Azog, Bolg, has an opportunity to face the dwarf that killed his father once again upon the battlefield. Da'in initially marched to the Lonely Mountain to support Thorin in his escalating dispute with the Lake Men and the Elves of Mirkwood. But as soon as Bolg's Orc army from the Misty Mountains, actually tragically from Mount Gundabad of all places, and their alliance with the Wild Wolves of Rovanion, after they show up, the Dwarves and Men and Elves all put their conflict aside and they unite against a common enemy. And although we all know that the Battle of Five Armies did end in victory for our heroes, and Bolg was crushed to death by a giant bear, we also know that it ended in tragedy for the royal line of Durin's folk. King Thorin was mortally wounded, and his heirs, Fili and Kili, were both slain. The line of Thror was ended, and so it was the heir of Gror who became the new king of Durin's folk, King Da'in Ironfoot. For 78 years after the events of The Hobbit, Erebor and the neighbouring Manish kingdom of Dale flourished again side by side. Dwarves and men prospered together, and each kingdom made the other stronger. And by the time of the Lord of the Rings, old King Da'in Ironfoot had developed a particularly deep friendship with King Brand of Dale, that's the grandson of Bard the Bowman. For 78 years, it was happy days in Erebor and Dale. But then came the War of the Ring. One day before the Battle of Pelennor Fields down in Gondor, when Da'in was 252 years old, the kingdoms of Dale and Erebor came under attack from an army of Easterlings in the service of Sauron. And Thus began the third and final great battle of Da'in's life. King Brand of Dale fought hard to resist the Easterlings, but before long his town was overrun. The men of Dale retreated to the gates of Erebor, and there they were met and defended by the armies of King Da'in for three days. Battle raged on the doorstep of Erebor, and the warriors of Brand and Da'in fought valiantly together to resist their enemy. In the end, though, the Easterlings were just too many, and King Brand was slain on the third day of the fighting. But his body did not fall into the hands of the enemy like Thor's did. And that is because of Da'in Ironfoot. While King Brand lay dead, 
King Da'in fought on to defend his body, just as Feely and Kili did to defend the wounded body of Thorin. And just like Feely and Kili, Da'in gave his life to do this. Around the very same time that Frodo and Sam began the final stage of their journey into Mordor, Da'in Ironfoot was killed by Easterlings, while protecting the body of his fellow king, Brand. But this is not quite the end of his legacy. After the deaths of Brand and Da'in, the dwarves and the men of Dale retreated inside the Lonely Mountain, and the battle turned into a siege. Our defending heroes looked to their new kings, their crown princes, the new King Thorin Stonehelm and King Bard II, sons of Da'in and Brand. And due in part to their leadership, the defenders of Erebor withstood the siege by Sauron's servants for ten days. But then... On the 25th of March, in the year 3019, everything changed. Roughly 800 miles south of the Lonely Mountain, there is another mountain of fire. And on March the 25th, the One Ring to rule them all fell into that fire and was unmade. Sauron was defeated for good. Although there was still more fighting to be done, the War of the Ring was effectively won. When news of Sauron's downfall made its way north, the besieging Easterlings lost their morale, and the dwarves and men inside the Lonely Mountain were filled with hope. Two days after the destruction of the ring, kings Thorin III and Bard II charged out from the great gates of Erebor and they drove the Easterlings far from the mountain, out of Dale and back towards the lands of Rune from whence they came. And although this war in the north is hardly as iconic as the wars in Gondor and Rohan, there is a fantastic line of dialogue spoken by Gandalf to remind us just how significant Da'in Ironfoot and his son and his allies truly were in the grand scheme of things. While resting in Minas Tirith after a job well done, Gandalf tells Gimli and Frodo, yet things might have gone far otherwise and far worse. When you think of the great battle of the Pelennor, do not forget the battles in Dale and the valor of Durin's folk. Due to King Da'in Ironfoot and the courage of his people and the bravery of the men of Dale, the armies of Sauron did not conquer the north. Middle-earth did not fall to ash and ruin. And just before I end this nice long video, there's one last thing to say about the line of Da'im. Because in the peoples of Middle-earth, Tolkien tells us that after his death, the line of Da'im prospered and the wealth and renown of the kingship was renewed until there rose again, for the last time, an heir of that house that bore the name of Durin. And he returned to Moria, and there was light again in deep places, until the world grew old, and the dwarves failed, and the days of Durin's race were ended. Through his grandfather Gror, Da'in Ironfoot, was a descendant of the original Durin, Durin the Deathless. And through his son, Thorin Stonehelm, 
Da'in was an ancestor of the final Durin. Durin the seventh, the last. The Durin who would reclaim Khazad Doom and make things right. Before the race of dwarves eventually disappear from the world. So, there's my take on 10 dwarves who truly made dwarven history what it is. 10 absolute legends from among the adopted children of Iluvatar. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, be sure to hit like and leave a comment and hit subscribe if you haven't already to make sure you don't miss any future Tolkien lore videos. But, as always, until next time, my dear friends, much love. Stay groovy and Navayar Melanin.